divine mercy, discipleship, devotions, and dirt. Our guest this week is Father Martin Lineback on Spirit Inspire, starting right now. Broadcasting from the Cathedral of the Assumption in Louisville, Kentucky, this is Spirit and Spire. And now, here is your host. Hello and welcome to Spirit Inspire. I'm your host, Eric Huff, and joined with me as always are Brian Kane. Hello. Isaac Fox. Hello. And John Saul. Hello. We are happy to present to you today Father Martin Lineback. Father, welcome to Spirit Inspire. <clears throat> it's a great, great joy and blessing to be here. Thanks, Eric. Father, before we get started, I'd like to ask you um, if it would be possible that you could bless our equipment. Um, you've been uh, such such an amazing influence and and help um, in getting this podcast started. And uh, and we were just wondering if you could bless our equipment. Be happy to do that. You know, as um, I was thinking about today and in sort of in preparation for today. Uh, it uh, was reminded, uh, Isaac, just a little bit ago, it was a, a year ago in July that we were all together uh, with a couple of other uh, leaders, really, at the cathedral. Uh, Mr. Bob Owens comes to mind, who's um, kind of a cheerleader for, um, uh, for what we do at the cathedral and was certainly a cheerleader for uh, all of you. <laughs> so as uh, you kind of brought this uh, forth, uh, it was uh, in my heart and in my mind to say, you know what, I would love for this to be connected to the cathedral some way. And then the Holy Spirit took over. So here we are. <clears throat> and here we are at, uh, at the cathedral uh, for Spirit Inspire. So I just want to say, first of all, uh, to everyone who's listening to us, to uh, the four of my brothers who are here, and to many others, uh, just I am so grateful for making this possible. Uh, so God bless each and every one of you. So let's just take a minute. I think it's a most appropriate thing to do. Uh, let's first of all ask for the Lord's blessing and for that Holy Spirit to continue to animate the mission of Spirit Spire. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with, with your spirit. spirit. Lord God of heaven and earth, from the very beginning, you created man and woman in your own image, told them to go forth. So throughout all of the centuries, there have been a variety and myriad of ways that the love you have for your people and the manifestation of that in Christ being among us in that other room, that upper room, where you gave your apostles, gave the Blessed Mother, the gift of the Holy Spirit. So on all of those who work for this particular apostolate, and for all of those who have created what we use to do that, microphones and cameras, televisions and monitors, May they serve continually as an instrument so that we will bring the good news to others. Let others know your son, Christ, the one we follow. So may the Lord's blessing come upon the four of you and others who help us and on this equipment, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beautiful. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. The Lord will be generous to us. Amen. All right. So just a brief introduction here. Um, Father Martin Lineback is the Vicar General of the Archdiocese of Louisville. And correct me if I'm wrong with any of these oh, titles here. That's my job. The rector. <laughs> it's called fraternal correction. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, the rector of the Cathedral of the Assumption the vocations director for the Archdiocese of Louisville, and, uh, and the chaplain of many other great organizations here. Um, is there any other titles we should know about? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm pretty interested in your role as the vocations director, um, but we'll get to that in a second. Can you tell us a little bit about, about yourself? Um, maybe anything else we should know? Certainly. Uh, I am a native of Louisville by uh, parents, actually back to great-grandparents. 
Uh, my grandparents on my one set uh, on my uh, mother's side uh, were all in Germantown. In fact, my grandparents were married at St. Joseph Parish, if you know St. Joseph Parish. Uh, and then uh, migrated to St. Matthew's, both sets. Uh, but uh, that, those were the days that uh, St. Matthew's really was potato fields. I don't know if you know that or not, but it was <laughs> never uh, heard really that. considered. Wow. I mean, it kind of grew into an outskirts uh, of the city. Um, maybe one of the earliest, besides the Highlands, one of the earliest might call suburbs. Uh, but in those days, it was very sparsely populated, but was really growing. Uh, people kind of moving uh, it from... Uh, from more of the urban setting to the more suburban setting and on the outskirts of the city. Uh, so that's where my, uh, that's where my roots are in St. Matthew's. Uh, and interestingly, and maybe this doesn't have much to do with anything, but uh, St. Matthew's is actually named after the Episcopal Church in uh, St. Mm. Matthew's. That's where it got its name uh, for the town. Okay. And St. Ma the St. Matthew's Episcopal Church is still there, very close to Holy Trinity Parish. My parents, the, the early days, and you all might appreciate this. My mother was the youngest of eight. So in that uh, generation, uh, everyone lived, or at least my aunts and uncles did, she was the youngest of eight. Everyone lived with her parents as when they were newly married. Uh, my grandfather, they had a large home in St. Matthew's and he fixed the third floor into an apartment. And so when you, until you got to the point where you could be a little more self-sustaining, then you lived there until you were able to move out. Uh, so I, my mother has told uh, great, great stories about uh, growing up in St. Matthew's and uh, walking to the Vogue Theater uh, to spend 25 cents on a movie, uh, mm -hmm. all of those great things. My parents eventually, I was born when uh, they moved to Linden, Kentucky and we were members of St. Margaret Mary Parish at that point. And then they built uh, our home in Middletown, uh, which is, I, we moved there when I was uh, going into third grade. So that's really most of where my memories were. In those days, in the Catholic Church, people, you know, will tend to, and then I'm sure lots who are listening will identify with this, uh, could usually find maybe a church home that um, nourishes and feeds them in a, in a particular way. Yeah. When I was growing up, that was not the case. There were boundaries, and you <laughs> stayed with those boundaries, or the pastor of this church was going to come after you if you belonged to this one over here. <laughs> <clears throat> so we were about three inches south of I-64, and we're in St. Edward Parish boundaries. Mm. So when I was in third grade, I started there, and then I finished with eighth grade. I went to a public high school, Eastern High School, a graduate of Bellarmine, and at that time was Bellarmine College, not Bellarmine University, uh, and then seminary uh, followed that. I'm sure some of the other topics and things that we talk about will kind of be integrated, and I'll give you a little bit more information uh, about that as well. I was ordained uh, a priest for the Archdiocese uh, right across the sidewalk there uh, in the Mother Church of the Archdiocese in the Cathedral of the Assumption. Uh, in 1987, so it's been 35 years, uh, a priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. Excellent. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, all right, so where did you go to seminary? I went to every, uh, and tell me, you're telling us things we don't need to know about and not interested in, but no, every wanna, wanna country <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, has a Catholic university uh, in that country that is sponsored by the bishops of that country. Okay. Normally they're in the capital city. Ours is as well, Catholic University of America. Mm -hmm. Normally those uh, universities will have a seminary connected to them, and that's where I went to seminary. Uh, the seminary is called Theological College, yeah. and it is right across the street uh, from Catholic University, and you might have visited the Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in, in Washington, D.C. is the largest church in the United States. Uh, so the seminary is located right across the street. So all of our formation activities uh, in preparation for ordination and in preparation for pastoral ministry uh, was at Theological College, and then all of our academics were at uh, Catholic University. Excellent, excellent. Well, that kind of leads me into, I, I know I said I was gonna wait, but um, you know, 
this this role as the vocations director. Um, vocations are, are really important to me, heavy on my heart. I'm sure it's true of everyone here. I'll let them speak for themselves, but I think that's an easy guess. Um, so tell us a little bit about um, being the vocation director and uh, what what is we as the lay faithful, what, what can we um, do to increase vocations and how does that relate to us? Uh, one of the priests of the archdiocese who was the vocation director uh, was invited to a diocese of Fort Worth in Texas, kind of alone, if you were to use that word, uh, for a year to work in Catholic charities. Uh, so he was the vocation director. There was some conversation about who's going to take care of the vocation office uh, and uh, talk to the archbishop about it. At vocation, I've always tried to be very supportive and very uh, engaged and involved in the work of vocations. For some reason, it's been very, very important to me. So when this uh, kind of situation presented itself, I uh, said to him, I'd like to do this if you will let me do it. And for some reason, I felt like it was truly a, a kind of a gift that was handed to me. Obviously, my love of my own priesthood, um, even the bumps in the road, I, I just felt like at this point in my vocation as a priest, if I can make some contribution to those who are going to serve you <laughs> and your children in the future, yeah. if I can have some influence <clears throat> in shaping and forming, and more importantly, recognizing those who I observe something stirring within them. Mm, yeah. Sometimes you don't even know it yet, but somebody has to name that for you and to kind of call that out of you mm. and bring that forth um, from your own mind and your own heart. Uh, I have to be honest with you, my spiritual director, whenever I say that uh, to him, always says to me, that, that does that mean you've been dishonest with me up to this point? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, most, most of my uh, friends who are priests and others and archdiocese and leadership uh, said, you're nuts. Um, <laughs> you're the vicar general for the archdiocese. You're the rector of the cathedral. You're nuts to, to want to do that. But I felt really, really strongly about it. And uh, very grateful to Archbishop Fav for, um, for letting me do that. And so far, it's been a true delight to me. It's, been a, it's brought me great joy, not only being with our seminarians, but being with uh, young uh, men. Haven't done a whole lot yet with uh, the women in consecrated life. That will come. Uh, but it's been a, a, just a delight and a joy to my heart uh, about that. What can you do? You can promise one of your children for each. <laughs> that, that was kind of the thing back in the day, right? Like well, you, there, was, there was almost, yeah, uh, I mean, it wasn't understood. Yeah. That, um, I've got enough for that. I mean, <laughs> so I think your home percentage is 40%. Not, um, <laughs> so, so Father, you were, you were saying about how some people don't even yet recognize the call. It's you kind of help them be aware of that. How did that play out in your own life? Was there a clear time for you when you were aware of that? Yes, uh, I want to go back to St. Edward, and I've only realized this, Isaac, in, in maybe the past uh, several years, but people will ask all the time, you know, what, what led you to this? Mm -hmm. You know, how did this happen? And I go back to uh, my sixth grade at St. Edward Parish. And the Ursuline sisters, the, what we would refer to in, in Louisville, the Maple Mount Ursulines, and their mother house is in Owensboro, not on mm, Lexington okay. Road. And I had uh, my sixth grade teacher, she will tell you that it was her first year of teaching when I was in sixth grade, but it was actually her second year of teaching, and I remember. <laughs> but I've, yet not, <laughs> I've not yet had the courage to correct her. <laughs> There was something about her as a religious. First of all, I think she was the best teacher I've had in all of my education. College, high school, grade school, and high school, college, seminary, postgraduate studies, all of it. There was a joy in her that did a couple of things with me. One, 
helped me understand it's a good thing to learn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a good thing to learn. That just makes you better. So the classroom, I don't want to say it was fun, uh, but it was, um, it was interesting. It, 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 it struck a chord, uh, at least it did with me. And I think she recognized it. And she established, I don't want to say I was her favorite, I, I wasn't at all. But I do <laughs> think she recognized something in me. And she was the very first one to ever say to me, do you think you might like to be a priest? No one had ever said that to me before, and she did. Mm. She was also the one that taught me the, the great love of music. She herself was a musician and beautiful voice. So I think that was the, um, that was the very first idea about that. And then uh, later on, really was the example of other priests that I thought, wow, there's something unique in their life mm -hmm. that was yeah. very attractive to me. Uh, so I just paid attention. I'm a great observer. I observe a lot and listen a lot. I get that from my grandmother and my, and my mother. They were great listeners. Uh, so I just paid attention to things and how the, how the Lord was working in my own life. And I still remember to the day I was in high school, late high school. That actually, that, I mean, I still remember the words. Uh, that's what I want to do. <laughs> that's what I want to be. I still remember those words. Um, all four of you are in the vocation of holy matrimony, so I don't know if there was a moment that said, she's the one. Uh, but I did have that, did have that experience. You yes. said that was late high school? Late high school. But yeah. you know, there are bumps in every row, right? Yeah. Uh, so my, you know, you get insecure at times, you worry, you have anxiety. Is this really the right thing? Am I supposed to be doing this? So when I was, uh, I first was connected, there was um, a, called a house of formation that was connected to Bellarmine. That's how I got connected to Bellarmine. So I enrolled in that. It wasn't really a seminary. I mean, it was and it wasn't, but it was shaped a little bit differently, structured a little bit differently. So I uh, was connected to that. Uh, there was a house on Bellarmine's campus that all of the, uh, the seminarians, if you will, uh, lived there. I can't remember exactly now how many there were. After my first year, uh, they closed that house. The archdiocese did. So that would have been under the auspices of the vocation office. Mm. Now, was that coincidental or directly related to you going there? <laughs> it was directly related to me going there. <laughs> There were signs everywhere. That going well. uh, so uh, they said you can go to a major seminary. Now I was a I was a mama's boy. Um, I had not lived anywhere else. Uh, we can talk about my family a little bit later if you like. But we, well, like we didn't go on vacation. My father was a real homebody. My mother probably would have liked to have gone some places occasionally, uh, but he just we just didn't do that. Um, so the, uh, the uh, opportunity was that, well, you can go to a major seminary someplace. Now that meant out of town. And that just scared me. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't think I want to do that. So I decided I moved back home. So you were a homebody as well. I was, I was, <laughs> yes. So I have that DNA of my father in me, probably some other traits too. I don't know that we'll talk about those today. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to move back home and to finish my time at uh, Bellarmine and I did. Near the end of uh, getting closer to graduation, and this kind of goes back to um, those, do you see how things, how the Lord coordinates things? It goes way back even to then. So I had one of my best buddies in high school, his father uh, was the manager of a retail store. You all might not know, John, but not of us, a native of Louisville, called Bacon's. So I was just started driving, and he said, they, um, if you need a job, go see my dad. And I did. And I was a porter. Do you know what that is? No. Porter is um, carry out packages for mm, okay. people. Oh. I also, so if you think of a train, um, actually there was one in the, in the old ordination, right? You were, um, 
there was the right of becoming a porter. Yeah. Which is of service, which is really a beautiful mm. idea. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! Is that a minor order? Of it was porter? a minor order. Okay. And yes, so it's only used in reference to trains now. You don't see porters at stores. Right? No, or maybe no. You're on your, you're on your own. You even have to check yourself out. <laughs> no, <I'm sure. laughs> This is a, no. I'm not going to say that. I was going to say <laughs> that we had the joke among us that we really were in service to um, to all the blue hairs. You know what that is? Yeah. No. <laughs> there was some thing that uh, women did uh, at that time that uh, when their hair was gray that there was this blue rinse in it and it really did look have a shade of blue about it all. So I did by the end of high school I wasn't sure so I went uh, you might have to cut this out uh, I went to um, started working full-time at Bacon's and went through a training program with them to, for a buyer so that's the person in the retail world that buys all the things, your shirts and ties and all those things. So I did that uh, and could have made a could have made a career there. There were the, the uh, it was a great place to work. I made really good friends. Every once in a while, I'll run into them. Um, so I always like to make this joke. So I went through the training program at one of the stores. And my area of responsibility was housewares. So I can still tell you a lot about your vacuum cleaners mm -hmm. and um, all of those <laughs> things. My first area of responsibility that was really my own uh, was ladies' shoes. So I always say ladies' shoes confirmed my vocation to be a priest <laughs> and my willingness to live a, a, a celibate life. Uh, after that experience. <laughs> So I got to the uh, end of all, and, and the tug was there. So parted company with retail, and then I uh, was preparing myself to go to, to seminary. But I had, I had a few things to pay off, like a car and those kinds of things. So I wanted to be in a place where I was going to be okay to go away. Now, the archdiocese certainly helps in the, you know, paying for, paying for things and the seminary studies. So Isaac, you will appreciate this, and I'm not sure you know this, but I wanted a job where I could just make decent money, no responsibility, and prepare to go away to seminary, and I worked at the Bristol. I found this out recently. You just yeah. found that out recently, <laughs> which is a whole other story of God's providence in a way. So I did. I, I left uh, the Bristol and uh, went uh, to Washington, D.C. for seminary, and that was four years in Washington. Ordination was in May of 1987. Okay, very good. Well, I think that that wraps up this segment. Um, May I add one thing to yes. be serious about your question? What can you do? Yes, sure. In, in my not only my life as a priest and as a pastor, but it, it's so clear to me now as vocation director, the seeds of vocation really begin at home. Yeah. So that begins with you all. And that begins if and when some have children, if and when children all come to you. It's really your role to foster that and pray for it. So the, the seeds of vocation begins at home and in the family. Sometimes it might happen in a little bit of a bizarre way. You know, sometimes it's um, instead of coming through the front door, it comes through the back door, you know. And, uh, but that's the, that's been my experience. So that's really the, what you can do, is pray and foster it in your own home. You know, having gone through seminary myself for a short time, even though we don't have children, I've seen a foreshadowing of that in youth mm -hmm. ministry. So I, I definitely say you're 100% right on that. And thank you for sharing that with us as married men, how we can do that for our children. Right. According to my five-year-old, she's currently on track to be a cowgirl princess nun. So um, she'd be one of the few. <laughs> like yeah. And on that note, cowgirl princess nuns. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you heard it here. Vocations start in the family, and the harvest is plentiful, and the laborers are few. We'll be right back here on Spirit and Spire. Hey everyone, this week's episode is sponsored by Family Renewal Project. FRP is a local theology of the body apostolate in service to the Archdiocese of Louisville. They're dedicated to renewing the culture through the renewal of the family. 
They have so many amazing things going on, so check them out at FamilyRenewalProject.com. And we're back on Spirit Inspire with our host, Father Martin Lineback. Um, I'm sure that these guys are eager to ask some questions over here, so let's throw it over to Isaac Fox. Thank you, Eric. And Father, again, thank you for being here today and taking time to hang out with us. My pleasure. Yeah. Um, my You're question. fun to hang out with. Good. I was going to say. You are too, Father. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I was going to say there's probably any kind of more interesting people you could be spending your Monday afternoon yeah. with. Um, so at the end of the last episode, we were talking a little bit about vocations, and you mentioned that sometimes it can be a bit of a bumpy road. Um, I think of my own uh, my own life story of converting and becoming Catholic. That it took three, four, five tries to, to actually enter the church. At one point, I. I sort of intellectually converted and then just walked away from it all for a number of years. Um, so I think every one of us I can speak for here are deeply grateful and blessed that you did hear that, that call and, and that became your vocation. My question relates to that. So in, I, I think it was around 2015 when you became the pastor of St. James at Elizabethtown, there was an interview, interview you did in which you mentioned that there had been a period of time in your life uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, 2000 to 2005-ish, where you had taken sort of a formal leave of absence from the priesthood and went and, you know, did other things. Went back to school, I think, and worked in, in New Jersey. Um, and then after the death of Pope John Paul II in 2006, you returned to active ministry. Would you uh, be able to share with us a little bit about what motivated you stepping away from the priesthood and then what graces brought you back to it? Again, as I say, we're really grateful you did. So, you know, um, Isaac, I always like to say to folks that the two most difficult decisions I have ever made in my life, uh, the first one was to leave and the second one was to return. And I think about that frequently and very grateful to God and the grace of God and, and the people that were instrumental in, in helping me see all of that. You know, I like to describe it as my um, kind of spiritual midlife crisis. I have probably been ordained, so that was 2013 years, maybe. Mm -hmm. Can't remember the exact number. And I was here, so but this, is, this is actually my third time at the cathedral. My first time was from 1994 to 2000, so I, I reflect on that now as I am getting older that, uh, the, because I kind of consider that that was a long time, six years to be here. Yeah. And I was a young priest then. So I kind of consider that the early days of my priesthood and sure. now the twilight days of my priesthood, I'm back again. What does that mean? You know, what, what's... What's the Lord up to? This is the golden era. Yeah. The golden era. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Tarnished, but golden. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way I describe it. Um, there was just um, emptiness. And I think also I was tired. You know, it, it, you all know. It just takes a tremendous amount of energy to live your life and to live it well, right? Yeah. Yeah. You think about your marriages, you think about your work, uh, you think about the restaurant, uh, you think about Holy Angel, all of those things. Um, St. Patrick and now your advancement as well. So I think that was part of it, uh, but I just kept having this terrible feeling of, wow, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. I don't know if I have it in me to do it anymore and I don't know this is the right thing. So I think there was a what I called or kind of a hunger and a thirst for what I thought was freedom, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it kind of, that turned out to be absolutely false. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I decided that Archbishop Kelly was here at the time. Uh, so I spoke to him about it. It really started formally to be kind of an extended sabbatical. Uh, but it did then turned into a leave of absence. Uh, it was at the strike of midnight uh, at the year 2000. And I remember uh, it was New Year's Eve. <laughs> I had a wedding on New Year's Eve. So I had to tell the couple, well, I have something to share with you. <laughs> I can have your wedding, but tomorrow I couldn't. <laughs> if it was on January 1st. But they were good with it, so... 
the Lord took care of it. I, so Y2K had a bigger impact than we realized yeah. until yeah. this. I said Y2K had a bigger impact. Yes, Remember, yes, everybody yes, was scared yeah. of Y2K, yeah. and then we got to it, and it was like, oh, nothing happened. But something actually did happen. Yeah. So right. We're just <laughs> now finding out. <laughs> it's a big deal. Uh, 22 years later. <laughs> yes. That's dramatic, Father. And there, there's that dramatic narrative of your life that maybe you didn't fully recognize at the time. But looking back on it, I mean, you could, on some level, there's cinematic value to that. I mean, you could make a movie of just the timing, the the intensity, perhaps, of not just emotion, but uh, spiritual and psychological uh, steps that you had to take. That's dramatic. <laughs> that raises a great question to me. If it was a movie, what rating would it have? <laughs> <laughs> and who would play you? you. Right, who would play <laughs> you? That's right. <laughs> So the important thing for me and for all those who, are, you know, thanks for listening. Thanks for being with us today. The important thing for me in all of this is that everything that happened to me was the work of God mm -hmm. and holy providence. Mm -hmm. Amen. And, you know, there's the old Baptist hymn, uh, even, this, even God guides the fall of the sparrow. And that is so true. So, it, and it's interesting to me, they appeared at the doors, <laughs> at the door of this cathedral last week. I didn't know they were here. I had, then that's another whole long story, but everything that happened to me in a beneficial way, in a positive way, was all related to the church. Everything that yeah. happened, including I had established good friends who live in London, not London, Kentucky, but. London, in England, and actually the, have the fake uh, one. <laughs> right. uh, David is a character. He had uh, been very, very successful in IT and um, made the joke that they have a home outside of London. And he's, he said, I got tired of looking for a parking place in London when we would go. So I bought a flat <laughs> with a parking garage. And he said, both of them, David and Caroline, wonderful friends and wonderful people. And they knew, you know, they knew what was the stirrings that were in me and what was coming to pass. And they said, if you want to, because it's probably important that you have a significant break. I mean, I've been a priest long enough that I knew a lot of people and had interactions and uh, interventions and in times with people and good and the bad and the, uh, the joyful and the sorrowful. So I knew a lot of people. So if I went, to Bristol, they were, you know, somebody's gonna know me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They said, it's probably important that you have a really clean break for a while. Were your, were your parents aware at all, Father Father Lineback, that this was of going on at the time? Yeah, were they confidants at this time? Or um, what was their relationship with your priesthood, if you don't mind reflecting on that? For you? Yes, my mother was, um, my, <laughs> my father was Archie Bunker. Um, <laughs> So he would always look at things through that particular lens. I mean, he was happy that I was a priest, proud. I would hear things that he would say to people that he would never say to me. You know, yeah. Yeah. That's just who he was. And uh, God rest his soul. And that don't, don't get me wrong that he was an evil person or you, know, you would not never ever want to meet him. Quite the contrary. I have a, lots of his traits, my sense of humor and homebody, all of those things. So. Most importantly, from my father, uh, is a very strong work ethic. I mean, mm -hmm. he worked tirelessly uh, to take care of his family. And in his own business, established beautiful friendships. You know, um, That's a whole other long story. Once a year during the summer, he would take me to work with him. Now, I've always had the dream of either driving a school bus or being an over-the-road truck driver. Always wanted to do that. It might happen yet. I don't know. I read an article a couple of weeks ago, at the beginning of the school year, uh, that there was a priest in Rhode Island, somewhere in the east. Uh, this huge uh, bus driver shortage. So he went and got his license, and he's driving a bus now. Uh, but, hey, uh, a lot of ministry wow. opportunities there, probably. I'm going to check, I'm I, gonna check I, that out. I've got an image coming into my my mind, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but. Did you drive a tractor or something at someone's wedding? I feel like I've seen that somewhere. <laughs> a large, some kind of large vehicle, and you at the helm. Um, 
Is, is I that... wouldn't doubt it at all. I have. There's a photograph <laughs> over in the cathedral office of yes, me driving. Okay. Uh, driving the tire. It might be upstairs. It might be upstairs. Okay. I can show it to you after the program. Yes, uh, I worked on my aunt and uncle's farm when I was in high school. Uh, the farm was uh, outside of uh, Shepherdsville in Bullock County, not too, okay. too far away. Yeah. Oh. And, and speaking of my father, uh, yeah, it would, that's my be, neck of yeah, the woods. It's in your neck of the woods, John. <laughs> yeah. And the, the, now not, the, the blessing for that, I mean, there were many, many blessings, but the blessing for that is at the beginning, I was not 16 yet, so probably 14. So my dad, would he worked in Lebanon Junction. That's where his plant was. So he would take me to the farm, and we had that time in the car, um, actually a pickup truck. So there was some conversation, but he, you know, he wasn't a huge talker. Uh, but those, that, that was a great time to be with him, and uh, he was tickled pink that I was doing that. You know, he's um, he's a, a country boy in a way. Country, boy, he has a country boy's heart. Mm -hmm. um, was raised here, but a country boy's heart. So yes, I did, and um, I've always, my mother always tells the story that when I was a little boy, the only way when I, because I was, could be cantankerous, uh, the only way she could get me calmed down sometime was to let me vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> but it was one of those old canisters, and the reason yeah. is because it had an engine and a motor, <laughs> and I wanted to be dealing with the motor. <laughs> So that was a, uh, a very, very nice time for me in my life. Um, you know, there's nothing about being that, um, you know, sometimes when you think about creation and the earth, and um, I had confirmation not too long ago, Archbishop Fob was away uh, down in the Rodelia, Kentucky. <laughs> this young man, it was confirmed, they're confirmed as sophomores or going into junior year. So I he was a farmer. So we argued about the best tractor. <laughs> uh, but he gave me, uh, he asked me at the end of the little conversation, he said, Dude, my, one of my favorite songs now is By Dirt. You heard it? No. I, you sent an email out and I got that, so yeah. I did actually. <laughs> it's a wonderful <laughs> song. There's a line in it that says, By Dirt, because God ain't going to make no more. Right? <laughs> wow. So there's something about that. I mean, getting up, you yeah. know, at dawn. Um, there's almost a mimic of religious life, mm -hmm. you know, of monastic life yeah. in that. You, you rise at the same time every day because the cows need you, you know. <laughs> yeah. And to um, just to be that close to the earth and to see the crops grow. And That's my dream, by the way. To be a farmer. Yeah. So connect us back to, you know, yes, so, so this is track. the relationship of mom and dad and childhood and farming. And, and the connection between your vocation and, and religious life. So was your mom, what was your mom's perspective on your vocation? And then was she, was she a confident, confidant at that time when you're, because we're heading toward your leave of absence. No, not really. You know, you probably had the same experience. You kind of protect your parents from things that you don't want mm -hmm. them to know. Yeah. No, I uh, Whether it's good, bad, or ugly. I, I want to probably experience. share the good more than the bad and the ugly. I knew that they would both be very... Um, rattled by this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My mother, my father did occasionally. <laughs> my father would, um, he would stay home and faithfully watch Mass of the Air. Mm -hmm. But if you asked him to go to Mass with you, is you know, just... <laughs> and I, 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 we never talked about that, so that's, but someday maybe I can have that conversation with him mm -hmm. or whatever, that, um, what was that about, you know? And mm -hmm. other priests, I think, would uh, agree that it's different being a priest in your family. You know, it's different. So you just got to kind of go with the flow at times. Um, both of my sisters, my older sister, uh, unfortunately died of pancreatic cancer the same year that my parents died. Mm. And she joined, um, was into different things, you know, like sometimes new age and those kinds of things. Uh, but it's in every family where, wow, if you think about um, your own pilgrimage of faith and why you're in this room today, all kinds of extraordinary things happen that are not always of God. You know, we have to be honest about that. They're not always of God. So, but, you know, a mother's intuition. Uh, my father, you know, would say something wrong. Um, 
But my mother knew, I mean, she could tell that something was happening that wasn't good. So, but I did, uh, I waited till it was clear that I was going to leave uh, and had that conversation in the family room at our mm. home. Uh, my father was, uh, which he was typical, do what you feel like you need to do. My mother's first response was she gasped. Mm. I'll never forget that. She gasped. Like, oh. But they eventually, you know, oh, as a parent, I guess to see your children where they are, maybe not where you want them to be. Uh, so they, they were very supportive and very loving through all of that. And I guess one of the blessings is that I would come home for visits and stay with them. And I mean, that hadn't happened since I was, I mean, to have that kind of time with them since I was in grade school or middle school, that you know what happens when you get high school, you're just not home much. Right. Um, and I think we, you didn't quite get there, but so there was a flat in you're London. You're gonna make me eventually. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm getting you back. So, so there's a flat in London because you're talking about coming back for visits, but I don't know that we quite got, maybe it was implied, but where you were, yeah. that you so were visiting from. So I had, um, it was at the cathedral, and it was after mass. So I was thinking, what am I going to do? And I've always been interested in psychology, not teaching, but in the counseling part of it. Right. Back to the root of the word, which means soul. Mm -hmm. So I was looking at schools and investigating. It was after mass on a Sunday here, and there was a younger man there. And I said hello to him, had not seen him before, introduced myself, he introduced himself. And I, he said, I'm new here. I said, oh, what brought you? I'm a psychologist. Mm. Oh, tell me a little more about that. Well, this is what I do. He was working at the uh, Central State Hospital, but I'm from Chicago. And I graduated from this school. It was the school that I was most interested in and <laughs> was investigating. Wow. So we developed a so I said, I, <laughs> can I have coffee with you? And he's sure. So I, I shared the story with him. And at that time then he said, I'll help you. I'll even go to Chicago with you if you want and introduce you to the school. That happened. So he became a friend. I've kind of lost touch with him in the past years. We became a friend. That was all church connected. You know, that wouldn't have happened if he had not been at Mass that Sunday. And even right. still, providentially, even though, you know, maybe in God's perfect will, you never leave the priesthood. But, you know, in, in God's permissive will, he's still putting people in your life that he knows are going to direct you in a certain way or help you, help lead you in a certain way that... Is going to get end, you back that's around. That's the yeah. end of the story, Brian. <laughs> well, right. Well, let's not get there yet. Yeah, no, no, I, the feel like, the I feel like you're still acting within the bounds of freedom, even though there's providence, because you don't want to say, well, it's just predestination. You had no choice in the matter. Where I heard it said once that, you know, God's freedom is like an infinite amount of branches, you know, on a, on a tree. And if you, you can choose branches that lead away from him, from the sun, but he has... He's om omniscient, omnipresent. I mean, he's all-knowing in every way. So he can have an infinite amount of branches that go back toward him. So an infinite amount of people, opportunities, situations that could give you the chance to recognize the gift of his love, his mercy, his patience. And I feel like everything that you're describing falls right into that. So he's just being gentle and loving to you mm -hmm. in this mm -hmm. moment, tenderhearted. Well, before before John branches off a little too far, here, uh, I think that's a good time for a break. Uh, so we're going to end this segment, but we'll be right back with Father Martin Lineback on Spirit Inspire. Hello, everyone. This episode is sponsored by Holy Angels Academy. Holy Angels is an independent school shining the light on the Catholic and classical tradition with a focus on virtue and holiness. Their mission is clear and simple, to help their students attain the end for which they were created, eternal happiness with God. Check them out at HolyAngelsLouisville.com. And welcome back to Spirit Inspire with Father Martin Lineback today. A um, lot of interesting uh, themes have come up 
and a lot of unanswered questions, but I think that, that we can tie them all back together with Brian Kane and his question. So, Brian, uh, the challenge is yours. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Eric. I think it's actually pretty easy to tie it all in because uh, my question was about suffering and mercy and where we are in your story. It seems like uh, it, we might be in for a bit of both. Uh, so um, my question was really uh, about divine mercy um, in a couple ways. So for context, for those who are watching, um, the, the church has really had an emphasis on mercy lately. And, and, and when, I, when I say lately in the context of a 2000 year history of a church, I mean the last 150 years, especially. <laughs> right. uh, but um, Tuesday, there was a lot of emphasis Tuesday. on it around yes, 33 AD. Yeah. <laughs> oh, for sure, for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's not like it's, it's uh, not, not been a part of the church's tradition, but um, but Christ came uh, in the mid uh, 20th century to a Polish saint, Saint Faustina, and he said, "I want to kind of reestablish a focus on my mer uh, on my mercy." I'm thinking of Saint Therese of Lisieux in the late uh, uh, 19th century. Uh, she wanted herself to be an offering to divine mercy, where uh, the the other Carmelites of her time were offering themselves to divine justice. And so they would say, I want all the, the divine justice owed an unrepentant sinner. Give it to me, Lord. And, and so they would die uh, interesting and often horrific deaths as a result of this sacrifice. And St. Therese said, well, that's uh, not really my cup of tea. I'll take all the mercy uh, uh, that, or all the grace rejected by unrepentant sinners. So give me that grace and mercy, Lord. And I consecrate myself to your divine mercy. And, and that spirituality spirituality influenced the church in, in many ways, obviously. And uh, St. Fausti Faustina was also told by Christ that he wanted the church to reestablish a feast of his mercy, which had been lost, which St. John Paul II, uh, a great mercy pope, did. Uh, we now have Divine Mercy Sunday after... Um, the, the Sunday after Easter. And, uh, and then I think where pe a lot of people do connect is now in Pope Francis's pontificate, there's been a huge uh, emphasis on mercy. One of the first things he did was declare a Jubilee <clears throat> year of mercy yes. and open the mercy doors. And of, Our Lady you know, Endure of Knots. Mm -hmm. Indeed. So that's sort I of- I learned that devotion from Pope Francis. Yeah. I had not, was not familiar until uh, he brought that to our attention. I, I think I'm just realizing now in this moment that uh, that I was coming back to the church at that exact time as he was elected. And so to me, it seemed like uh, just <laughs> some, you know, like a, a devotion that was just this mm -hmm. sort of pot Catholic culture. But uh, but I was really all about you, Brian. It was. Yes. As all these episodes <laughs> really are. Let's be honest. Oh my um, God. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> long question. No, I keep going. I mean, we will be merciful question. to Brian. So, so, so what was your question? <laughs> uh, luckily, Our Lady has undone enough knots in my life that sometimes I can transition to other people. And so the question is, <laughs> everywhere you've been pastor, you have put up a giant image of uh, divine mercy. A friend of yours told me you maybe refer to it as a cathedral-sized image of well, divine one, mercy. Actually, or this, yeah, think, yeah, or this is it just is, this one? This one is a, was referred to as a cathedral size. Okay, so here you put up a cathedral. Uh, the others are, you sort of can't miss them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, fair enough. So the question that I wanted to ask you, even before we were digging into your story and realizing we're probably at a, a moment in your testimony that's a that's suffering and mercy was about suffering and mercy are there moments in your life where you've in, experienced suffering you've alluded uh, obviously to some deaths in the family um but where where you've experienced this great suffering but also encountered in the same moment that divine mercy that's been an emphasis of the church and how has that played a role in your story maybe starting with uh this time moving to london uh, let me kind of um, start at the end, if I might. I do. I did develop, and it wasn't so much um, a part of my spirituality, or more importantly, prayer life. That began the, what might be referred to as the devotional life of the church uh, until I was away. That's where that really began for me in a very serious and special way. 
have a little um, saying by Abraham Lincoln upstairs uh, that's, I think, from one of his, it's either one of his speeches or letters, that it, it, right, it was at the critical time of the, of the Civil War. You know, and you can, wow, well, sometimes you think you could almost, and maybe this is overly dramatic, but they're uh, reading that quote from me and my own life, I could say that you could almost smell the blood. You know, you could almost mm. smell the blood of the Civil War. And in this quote, you can sense the desperation of this man. And the, the, the quote is this, there have been times in my life when I have had nowhere else to go but on my knees. Not a powerful line. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I've had it with me since those days. There's never, you know, so there's many beautiful things happen. I, when I returned and really became influenced by uh, divine mercy, was my prayer really was, Jesus, forgive me for not trusting in you. Mm -hmm. mm. That, that's, a, that's a phrase as part of the divine mercy devotion that comes that's from St. Faustina. Jesus, 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 I in you. <laughs> Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. So... And so there's nothing, and you, maybe you've, I'm, I'm sure people have different experiences and um, everyone has had their own version of, the, of this story. But there's not a more frightening time in your life when you think, I have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, I was blessed in many ways by things that happened uh, over and over again. I alluded to that earlier. Everything was connected to the church in some way. Uh, the school that I went to was connected. Um, I ended up not studying psychology at, in Chicago, so I was, spent the summer in London. Kind of the prodigal son, if you will, that's what I felt like. <laughs> I should go home and apologize to my father. Um, but, you, you know, those things help you to grow in... Um, in grace and in blessings uh, that could not have, that could not come uh, another way. I mean, there's the the cru small crucifix right before us. Make a long story short, I ended up uh, by people that I was connected to in Chicago to take me to this degree program at Loyola University, and I. I did get the degree. It was master's in organization development, human resources management. At a wedding at the cathedral once, where uh, part one of the members of the wedding party, Francois, who was French, was here because he was the um, what do you call it um, exchange student mm -hmm. with the groom. Uh, they both went to Vanderbilt. He was in the wedding. I had a converse, couple conversations with him and his girlfriend. So when I was finishing my degree, and I for some reason stayed in contact with him. Uh, you know, that the life of a priest, that's generally not going to happen. Yeah. yeah. But, it's hard. Uh, stay, um, stay friends with couples that are in the wedding party. I get an email out of the blue uh, from Christine saying, I have gone to work for this American company. I'm in charge of all the business in Europe. I am in New Jersey training. I think there might be a job here. I had gone on so many interviews, and that's where the... <laughs> I have nowhere else. I can't go to another interview. The only place I need to go is on my knees. You know, Jesus, I trust in you. And for the sins of my life, um, you know, St. Faustina will write in the diary about uh, the Lord's mercy, God's mercy being so, um, so perpetual and endless. It's like standing, looking at the ocean. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's no vision of its end. I needed that so desperately. Mm -hmm for the salvation of my soul and to know that tomorrow is going to be okay <laughs> if yeah. you place your trust in the Lord. So that's where my devotional life um, kind of took off because I don't know that, I mean, I, I guess I would welcome it in a way uh, to kind of align your own suffering with Christ. That's always spiritually advantageous to do, but I don't know that I would welcome it because it's pretty scary. Mm -hmm. 
So being in my little bitty, itsy, expensive apartment in Chicago, actually it wasn't very expensive for Chicago standards, uh, but it was an old apartment. And <laughs> I mean, I, when I was at the cathedral before, I lived here. I mean, there's not much shabby here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this old apartment had radiators, so the windows would freeze in the winter on the inside. <laughs> oh, my. That's penitential. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. So that's where I learned uh, to rely on those prayers that the church offers us. It was for the first time in my life that I realized they offer it to us for good reason. You know, um, if you just need to go back to the basics. <laughs> when people ask me times, wow, it's prayer, and especially conversations with seminarians or those that are uh, discerning that vocation uh, will we'll ask questions about that. And I go to the basics, mm -hmm. go to the basics. I remember watching on television the election of Pope Francis and when he asked everyone to pray with him. And he launched into the Our Father. <laughs> and I thought, I know that prayer. <laughs> I know that prayer. That's a beautiful gift that is part of being Catholic and part of the church. So I began to learn those devotions. And I began to go back. I mean, I knew them, but they weren't a serious part of my life, I went back to those. Because there's nothing more powerful than being home alone and you have nothing else to rely on. Now, did that mean I was all by myself and nobody would help take care of me? Of course not. You know, I could have called my parents the next day and said, I'm coming home or, or, or whatever happened. So upon my return, and we're back to, um, I didn't do it at St. Aloysius was the first parish when I returned from the leave of absence that I, that I went to. And I have to say, you know, I said it earlier, most, two of the most difficult decisions uh, was to, to go on the leave of absence and the second most difficult was to return. Because returning, I had to say, this is in your hands. <laughs> in a way that it has not been before. And so I need to live my life as a priest and hopefully pastor, good pastor, in the way, in what you have assigned me to do. We had a discernment retreat uh, last weekend, not this weekend, but last, and um, I shared with the young guys that I, I've changed my phrase. I used to say, what, whatever the Lord asks you to do, but in, since my return and those years, I've changed that and said, it's what the Lord assigns you to do. Mm. You know, you can think about, wow, this is a great creative idea. You know, this is marvelous. But this is what the Lord has assigned you to mm. do. It all happened uh, by the finger of God, you know, creating all of this. And for every place that you hang your hat during the day or at night, that's what the Lord has assigned you to do. I uh, had a spare if that help. So I want to now finish that so yeah, you don't ahead. have to say, please answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> so as I move from parish to parish, uh, I wanted people to have the opportunity, the open door to experience that ocean of divine mercy that is absolutely perpetual and infinite and free. <laughs> All you need to do is to be beggar at the door of the Lord, and he will provide that for you and give you that beautiful, beautiful gift. As a sign, and as a powerful sign of that, I wanted every parish that I was assigned to, <laughs> I wanted them to have that gift. Not so much of the image, but what that image stands for. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've tried to help people understand and explain to them, this is my gift. To you, this is my gift to you, as members of this um, community of faith. So I did that. I did that at um, St. Patrick. I did it at St. James in Elizabethtown, and I, and I did it here. And oh my goodness, to see that flooding of that grace, mm. <laughs> that flooding of divine mercy, um, 
I, gosh, that's been a huge return to me. I mean, that's been a huge return. So in a nutshell, that's the way it really was in a nutshell. It was a whole peanut farm. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's, where the, that, that's where the divine mercy uh, image has come from because it's, a, it's that important. It's been that important to me in my life and I'm always um, eternally grateful for that gift, if that, that helps. There were, uh, yeah, of course, and there were a couple nuggets that, that, you know, that really stood out to me there. What I was starting to say was that I had a spiritual director, uh, Father Paul, who's Opus Dei, who said that, um, you know, unless you're, you know, very, very sure that God's calling you to something different, you should be doing what you're already doing 100%. Because any any day you're going to have doubts, you're going to have struggles, you're going to have times where you have to persevere. And so, you know, that what you said about assignment really gives us a clear indication of, of what we're called to. That was one thought. Another thought was, um, you, you sort of briefly mentioned it, but you talked about offering up suffering and whether... Um, you know, that's something that a lot of people's grandmas say, mm. but, uh, you know, a lot of Catholics, up, that's, that's also up. been, that's also been lost to a lot of Catholics. Would, would you mind, uh, maybe, you know, maybe we can spend a little theological time here. So this has been, you know, fairly, um, story driven at this point, but I'd love to hear if you're willing a little reflection on what, what exactly does offer it up mean? Is there a practical thing there that people can take away from this part of redemptive suffering yeah that's yeah. exactly you still took the words oh. John, <laughs> so, uh, you're fine John. <laughs> yes so, so that for me i mean the in the life of a of, of a parish priest uh have you are you familiar with diary of a country priest Mm -hmm. read I, the book or, don't think I so. encourage you to read the book there's also some very very fine movies about it as i said um Story of a young, in those days, they would call a young curate. So he yeah. would have been the assistant pastor, the younger priest. And then he eventually goes to his own parish. But he has this, there's this line in the book, uh, to raise others on the shoulders of Christ. Isn't that a beautiful line? Yeah. And that's part of the life of a pastor. That's part of a life of a parish priest. There's tremendous, um, there's tremendous suffering in, myriad of ways. I um, was in Ashland, Kentucky this past weekend for a wedding and uh, unfortunately the mom and dad are divorced and have been divorced for a long time. And it was one of those situations of just kind of happened overnight. Uh, the pain uh, with the children, I, I mean, it's just, <laughs> there's nothing much else you can do except try to be kind and charitable. Mm. There's nothing, so that's where the redemptive suffering comes back in. And I did it this weekend and I do it for others, I try to, is to take their place in that. And to say, I'm gonna offer this, I'm gonna, in my own suffering. I'm, and I, you know, watching you, my parents were, um, my mother was bedridden for the past two years of her life. Mm. Uh, and on a feeding tube. She was a saintly woman. I, she never complained about anything with the exception of my father. Um, and that wasn't very often. Uh, but the beautiful thing about that is that he cared for her mm. in l such loving, tender ways at the end of their years. Um, That's beautiful. He did everything he could for her in his, his own losing strength and all of those things. Um, mm. So that's uh, if that's if that's helpful. And my grandmother and my mother both used to say to me, "Well, just offer it up." And I would get angry when they said that because I had no idea what they were talking about. And I, you know, at first I thought they were being kind of glib. Mm -hmm. It sounds uh, unsympathetic at first, yeah, doesn't yeah. it? Uh, but Catholic they way did. of saying shut up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> get over it. Uh, but theologically but, sound. But right, they, right. Yeah, they didn't mean it that way. Um, that way at all. Right. It. it go ahead. No, just real quickly, a couple of things. Uh, you were connecting this idea of offering it up, of that being united to Christ on the cross with uh, the story of a divorced couple. I was listening maybe some months ago to a podcast, and for life of me right now, I can't remember what it was, but it was a Catholic podcast. And the subject of divorce and how that affects children 
was brought up. And I remember the, the person speaking on it, making this comment about how incredibly difficult married and family life can be. It's full of crosses and how we need to accept those crosses. And he said, but divorce is not a matter of saying, I don't want the cross. It's a matter of taking the cross and handing it to your kids and saying, here, you get to bear, carry, mm, carry this. Wow. It's wow. And it almost yeah. brought me to tears when I was listening to it because, you know, there's many, many reasons for divorce. And I don't want to even get into all that, but I think that we often do fail to realize the incredible impact that that has on children in every situation. And it's kind of uh, opposite what you're saying, which is like, let's pick up a cross for somebody else. And in the last segment, yes. The, the words that, that, that come to me is, I want to take your place. You know, yes. so I step in for you in that regard. And that is, I think, also that communion of suffering with, with Christ on the cross as well. So I'm sorry yeah, to interrupt no, you. No, no, that's, that's perfect. Um, you mentioned in the last segment, you talked about how when you left the priesthood for a while, you feel that some of that was founded on a false sense of freedom. And in my mind, I'm kind of connecting these two things because I believe every one of us has a vocation. And we think of vocation, now we think of job, right? Like something I get to pick or choose. I like this job, I don't like it in a few years, I go over here. Conflating I, occupation and vocation. Exactly, yeah. exactly. In the Catholic understanding, vocation flows, you know, what we are supposed to do flows out of what we are, what God has made us to be. And I think we can never be fully happy, fully satisfied until we are fulfilling what God has made us to be, right? It's like, you know, if I went and tried to be a, a tree, I'd be miserable because that's not what I'm made to be. And I, it just made me think about that in my own family life because I've been through similar feelings. You know, married with eight kids, amazing wife, I've been blessed with eight amazing children. But there are absolutely those days and times, all that, we feel like, I have no freedom. You know, second I get home from work, it's taking care of the kids. I wake up, first thing, it's taking, you know, it's, you know, there, there's those days and weeks of this madness. And you feel like, man, I love a little freedom right now. And I think that what takes time to realize is the fact that that is, if you let go and let God, it is creating an internal freedom by enabling us to become who we are supposed to be, to grow through that. But it is a natural human response to kind of shove it away and say, no, I don't like this suffering. I don't like this lack of freedom. I don't like whatever it is. Uh, but it's only when we embrace it, when we embrace the cross, that we will find the resurrection and find true freedom on the other side. Um, and I'll shut up, but I think it applies not just to the priesthood, but to, to all of us, even married people, because I think every married couple has this battle at some point. It doesn't have to be divorced, it can be in much smaller areas, but just like, you know, I'm frustrated, I don't feel freedom, I'm tired of, I'm tired of changing another diaper, whatever mm. it might be, you know, and don't realize that that is precisely where God has put us to make us flourish. John, Paul, we'll II. Do it. John Paul II said it, more often than anything, quoting Gaudium et Spes from Vatican II, he said, man cannot fully find himself except by making a sincere gift of himself. Absolutely. And so real freedom is, like you're saying, that interior freedom of how can I be a gift to others? And that can be man and woman in marriage, to yeah. your children, to each other, but a priest a pastor to his people, you know, married to the church, right? That beautiful imagery of, of God's love poured out uh, from your own redemption, right? And own redemptive suffering into the hearts and minds of all kinds of other people. You know, because Christ didn't suffer and die so that we wouldn't have to. Christ suffered and died so that we would know how to, as I heard once. Right. Yeah. to redeem our suffering. Uh, that's excellent stuff. I think uh, this is a good place to button up this segment, but sure. there's going to be much more when we come back to Spirit Inspire. We'll see you soon. Hey everyone, here at Spirit Inspire, we want to serve our community by highlighting God's work in our parishes, schools, and apostolates. We hope to bring renewal and unity between all those in the body of Christ. If you would like a shout out in the next episode of Spirit Inspire, go to spiritinspire.com or email us at spiritinspire at gmail.com. Thanks and God bless. 
Welcome back to Spirit Inspire. As for our final segment, we're still joined with Father Martin Lineback. Um, I think John Soule, over to my left-hand shoulder here, um, has been itching to ask a question himself. So John, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Yes, okay, thank you very much, Eric. And again, Father, thank you so much for being here with us. It's been a, a, a real delight. Yeah. Actually, um, Absolutely. I'm getting, having a blast. So maybe I'll come back. <laughs> I like yeah. that. Yeah. Great. We'll have you back. You live this, nearby. Right, right you live yeah. nearby, <laughs> not too far away. Um, this is a, a question, it's twofold. So uh, this one has to do with kind of where you are now, but also, I noticed while we were speaking um, that you didn't say a whole lot about John Paul II and mm -hmm. his influence, and that was something that I think is very, very big in my life as well. I mean, I was confirmed a week before he died, um, and so it was. It's always been a big, uh, big thing in my life to have JP two just kind of being at the forefront of my whole conversion as well. Um, but with that, first, what is your vision for the cathedral as you're now rector here? And how do you hope to bring more people into the parish, you know, to really increase and bring renewal on that level? Uh, as you, as I've heard you say, it's like a new era, right? An era of excellence of sort. And then uh, I also noticed at the beginning uh, today that you had not mentioned another role that you also have as uh, the chaplain of Family Renewal Project. Mm -hmm. And I serve as director of discipleship and, and uh, Donna and Gary and so many of FRP are, are grateful for your uh, uh, chaplaincy, your spiritual guidance on that. And, uh, and because they're the theology of the body apostolate and I'm the kind of theology of the body guy, I guess I'll take that right. Nerd. <laughs> Nerd, right. Um, they, uh, I would say, what is your experience with Theology of the Body? And as chaplain of FRP, how is Family Renewal Project helping to spread that message? And so first, vision of the cathedral, and then uh, vision of TOB and, uh, and FRP. Great. Sure. If I could uh, loop back just a little bit, because I think you all are making some really important points that I think it is important for people to, uh, to hear. Uh, kind of back to the, the sense of uh, suffering and chaos, and oh my gosh, there's certainly enough of that in our world today. Yeah. Both that's happening at homes and the communities and the country and the world. But here's my, if I would say, spiritual litmus test that what is truly happening is of God. If in the midst of all of that, and I have to say, all of the things that happened to me there still was this, but it took me a while to be able to, um, to feel it really in my, at the bottom of my soul and the bottom of my heart. But whatever you're doing and whatever you're about, if in, even in the midst of that chaos, if there is a sense of true, genuine, God-given peace in your heart <laughs> and in your soul, and in your mind, that's the work of God. Somebody has said Opus Dei um, mm -hmm. and Saint Jose Maria Escriva. So that, I just think that's important for people to know. It's important, it was important, obviously, uh, for me to experience, and that, that's, a, that's a gift for God. Do you think we misunderstand a piece? I think that- Like people in general? Yes, I, well, yes, I do, I do, because I did. I did. Because you I said thought, peace I, in the midst of chaos. I think yeah. most of us would think peace would mean no chaos. No. No. It means that there is still a sense of the word that comes to me is two words. There's still a sense of security and a sense of serenity. Mm. Even in the midst of all of the chaos and confusion and the, really, and the difficult times that life is just a part of it because of our fallen human it's that nature. That interior vision. And I loved how you had said about the ocean of mercy, how there was, uh, there was no vision that you could have of its end. And I feel like if, if we don't have a, a vision uh, for the archdiocese, for the cathedral, for other parishes, we'll never find you know, our way. But it's a, it's a different kind of vision because it's a vision that's steeped in the confidence and certainty of a God who loves unconditionally, infinitely, mercifully. And uh, I, I, I just really, everything you're saying about that desire for peace and that interior calm resonates with me 
because of that divine mercy and uh, that that vision of Jesus in the divine mercy, Jesus, I trust in you, that is infinite and doesn't have an end in sight. There's something, it's a both and, both a vision of the invisible, right? Absolutely. Beautiful. Amen. Amen. What was that? If I could recommend yeah, one a more. book, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, it, which is in call, entitled Interior Freedom mm -hmm. uh, by Father Jacques Philippe, if you might be familiar with some of his writing, but I would recommend that highly. The second thing, to close that loop, uh, is that we were talking about that suffering and that sense of sacrifice, and that's, uh, as Isaac, you said, is there a misunderstanding about that piece? I also think frequently there can be a misunderstanding that I have about what that means, sacrifice. Mm -hmm. You know, going back to the sacrifice and its Latin roots, I always share with engaged couples that, that, that married life is based on sacrifice, but it's a reflection of the, of the sacrifice of Christ, which means that you're not giving up anything, but you're sure, surely giving away a lot. So it's not giving up, but it's giving away. Back mm -hmm. to that pure understanding in the Christian life of what sacrifice is all about. I discovered, I might have shared this with some of you at some point, I discovered uh, it, it's actually still used in the, uh, the extraordinary form, but it's an exhortation that the priest would read at your wedding. And the line that caught my, I'm not even sure how I ever discovered it, but the line that caught my attention, which is so valuable, is sacrifice is usually irksome. Nobody even uses the word hmm. irksome. Yeah. <laughs> that irked me. Yeah. <laughs> right. Sacrifice with love is easy. Sacrifice with perfect love is joy. Hmm. Mm. Now, we will not have that perfect sacrifice in this life, and the only one who truly did uh, was Jesus Christ on the cross. Um, but we aspire to that and we want to participate in that. So thanks for letting me close the loop. I think one of the most interesting right. paradoxes is that the that Christ had perfect joy while dying on the cross. Mm -hmm. I mean It's a picture of a happy <laughs> man. That's what like yeah. Bishop Barron saying is Catholicism yeah. series. I'll a never picture of a happy Yeah. Yeah. In, in crucifixes, I love the crucifixes that um, well, Christ is looking up. Uh, pay attention to that sometime. You know, a lot of the crucifixes he will be, uh, his head bowed in submission to the will of God and to this, for our salvation. Uh, but I'm always struck by those where he's uh, kind of gazing up. Uh, so just pay attention to that. I think sometimes we, we focus also on his sacrifice. Um, well, and this is a not, would be a non-Catholic concept, the idea of penal substitution, but kind of like you know, bearing some sort of punishment for us. And we forget that it is also an act of worship. It is the ultimate, you know, no human could ever offer fitting praise to God. And that is the ultimate mm -hmm. act of praise. That's an interesting thing to think about in that mm -hmm. context. It's him loving the Father and praising him. A slight With addendum. part of his being. Which is that we, the only way we can offer perfect praise is mm -hmm. united to him and through him and in him. Right. Which is... And the what that gets opens to up. The gets he, to offer the, the Eucharist. So you have a very special, that's a very special Because role. he's the source and summit. He's the very central focal point of human existence, right? I mean, if you really put it, boil it down to it, it's beyond Catholicism and Christianity. It's this universal, uh, perfect reality. And I feel like it kind of connects directly to these questions I've asked you with how do you bring renewal to the cathedral? How do you bring people back into the parish, you know? Uh, what does that look like? I'm not sure. <clears throat> uh, what I do Right, I'm not saying is, you're the no. savior, Father. <laughs> no, what, uh, the term that I would use is, we are, I think, in this, every parish and every um, organization, every family, uh, will have all those particular chapters. You know, mm -hmm. your, your little ones are at home now. Yeah. But they won't always be. Yeah. And then you're going to look at your wife and say, what's your name? <laughs> <laughs> Without sufficient coffee, you know, it's uh, possible any day. So when I, you know, I love the image of, uh, of Mother Church. And you all uh, brought this uh, to our attention a year ago in July when you did that awesome presentation. But it, and that has caused me to reflect on 
Wow, Bishop Flaget is resting right beneath us. Um, we need to take advantage of that. <laughs> but don't, let's not let him get lost. Yeah. And in this building, uh, upstairs, he would have looked out. That's a pretty powerful memory. He would have looked out. Um, and the description of him, uh, the only image of a woman on a street in the city of Louisville is Mother Catherine Spaulding, and she's right out there. Mm -hmm. um, and talk about sacrifice and all of the things they did. So I ponder, what's the Lord assigning us to do in this particular era at the cathedral? And just to give limited words to it for me, it's a renewed zeal for the beauty of our Catholic faith. Yeah. That's what I hope for and dream about and pray for. This, the, how that's going to happen, I don't have. I, I don't have all the answers to that. Uh, but that's what that's what I want. One of the things that has uh, really been a, a delight for me uh, is the guests that come here. Um, and I do think that, that there's, going to, there's an evolution to, to really the life of a cathedral. I've thought about that. I've meditated about that, uh, prayed about that, studied that a bit, that it's, it's different because it's not your neighborhood parish. Yeah. You know, you can't get in, you know, just come a couple blocks from home and be here like you can right. in a normal more neighborhood closer to my home uh, parish. Mm -hmm. I mean, you made the decision with your family, right? To join a parish that just, it's, it's in our home. Yeah, you know, this is where we, we are. We can walk this, there, yeah, this ride is our where bikes we and put them in the north. And there's so. something very important to that, <laughs> but that doesn't happen here. Uh, so what's the life of a, not only our cathedral, but what's the life of a cathedral, those that are in urban settings, uh, what's that gonna be like? Uh, in the future, and, and what is what's the Lord going to assign to us to do? And I don't have answers to that, but I do know that a kind of the normal parish life that we would experience, I think it's shifting. Um, it's different. It's not, you know, I was I shared before, I was here from 1994 to 2000, and it was different, you know, uh, the, the, there was clearly more defined kind of parish and uh, you could see those ministries happening uh, day by day, day following day, but that's not so much anymore. And it's not only us, but it's many other cathedrals that it's happening for as well. So we're, I'm gonna rely on the help of others to, um, to determine that and to listen and to observe uh, what's, uh, what are, the, what are the, the steps that we need to pay attention to, what do we need to focus on uh, in the next couple of years uh, that will help us kind of understand and respond to, go back again to uh, what the Lord has assigned us to do. So we'll see what we'll see what the Lord does with it. If well, that I, probably doesn't really answer your question, but that's, no, just, the, that's the best I can do today. But Father, just the talking about it is part of that process. You know, mm -hmm. and I think of Bishop Flaget being uh, uh, some level you know, there's that spiritual presence, you know, hopefully his prayers, you know, are, are with us in that. Uh, I think of John Paul II, you know, and his prayers for the, the universal church throughout the world. I mean, I couldn't imagine the weight on any pastor's shoulders for any parish, um, but to be the rector of the cathedral, that's got to be very unique, perhaps, because, you know, if the cathedral really is the spiritual center of the archdiocese, if we want to bring renewal to all of our parishes and ministries and offices, I wonder to myself if it may very well start here. And for us to be here with you is a, is a great privilege. Um, and I know that you have that devotion to John Paul II. And but, you know, it just came to me that maybe the, this is part of the renewal. Mm, yeah. <laughs> perhaps, mm -hmm. perhaps it is. And that was in my mind um, right. when I said, gosh, would you consider letting the cathedral host this, that yeah. was actually in my mind. Well, one, one thing that, you know, when you said zeal, 
um, and I know we want to talk about theology of the body a little bit, but that came to mind when you said zeal was like, to me, zeal flows out of an encounter with Christ or with something that you want to share. I mean, in the Christian context, we're usually talking about encounter with Christ, but any zeal, any passion about, you know, I, I would back uh, in my college town over the weekend and my buddy uh, has become very zealous about Appalachian mushrooms and like mm. treated us to delicacies of, of the woods around his house. And, um, but I'm where does sure that- he's identifying correctly. <laughs> yeah. And we're talking about uh, <laughs> food mushrooms, uh, just for the record. Well, I'm just saying the poison um, <laughs> <of the wines. laughs> um, Yes, and, and, but he knows all that. Yeah. And, and, it's, and his passion is contagious. And it was so much fun to learn about Appalachian mushrooms. Um, but, uh, but you know, that encounter with Christ, that authentic encounter that sparks fire and joy and love, that's that flow. So, you know, part of this is, you know, part of our mission that we've talked about is trying to help foster an encounter with Christ. And where can we do that? You know, in the Eucharist, in adoration, at mass, in the poor, um, but also, you know, maybe I'll transition here in the teachings of the church, including theology of the body, which sort of uh, can un, untwist some maybe um, way, things we've taken in about the church's teaching that aren't, aren't always correct or we, did, we didn't hear them properly. I think theology of the body, JP2, Christopher West, these guys do a great job of, of preaching the gospel in a way that speaks to people's hearts. So I don't know if that was a good transition or not. Mm -hmm. but. Four out of 10. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd let me speak to uh, Pope St. John Paul II for a moment, but it, uh, because that really will close the loop about my chapters of my life. I really credit him with my return mm -hmm. yeah. um, and his intercession. And um, at his death, uh, Pope Benedict talking about he is blessing us from the window of his father's house. Mm, uh, that was in his beautiful homily. image. <laughs> And literally, I felt that mm -hmm. in uh, New Jersey. Wow. <laughs> the, the weekend of his uh, death and then subsequent funeral, sitting in my little bitty apartment in New Jersey, on the sofa, watching all of this in Rome. Now, these things have been stirring. So it wasn't just that's the day of his death or leading up to his death. It had been stirring. Mm -hmm. One that I firmly believe, you know, once a priest, always a priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, uh, the ancient priests of the, of the Old Testament of Israel. And saying to myself, wow, that's my home. Mm -hmm. And I want to go home. <laughs> home not being Louisville, Kentucky, here, but the church is my home. And what I was missing was the, the privilege of the priest to be able to enact the sacred rites, in particular the sacraments, and in particular mass. Uh, so he, uh, I give my credit to him. That, so you can either, I said to Archbishop Kurtz and to Archbishop Fahm, you can either be happy with him or blame him, whichever, <laughs> you, whichever you decide. I think how dramatic that is from the stroke of midnight in the year 2000 to the stroke of John Paul II's death on the eve of Divine oh, Mercy, Mercy Sunday five years later. Mm -hmm. But again, yeah. movie material, Father. <laughs> so. At least podcasts so far. Yeah. Right. Uh, You'll have we'll, to talk to Shia LaBeouf I, about yeah, that. Yeah, Shia LaBeouf <laughs> might be a good start for it. <laughs> so my friendship with Pope St. John Paul II when I returned, uh, I can't tell you exactly how I was introduced uh, to his work and to his contribution to the church, huge. Uh, theology of the body, I, I don't know. But uh, all I know is that it came into my life. I started learning about it. I s had curiosity about it, uh, even to the point that I think in the Archdiocese of Louisville, and here's our master. Oh, gosh, uh, master. I don't know that I heard it. I don't know that I heard that term. Yeah. Uh, but it came to me, and uh, to the point of I thought, that was my first couple of years uh, having returned, I want to go on that institute. <laughs> so I did. I hauled off to Pennsylvania and went to the, uh, the week-long uh, that you've done several of. Yeah. Um, and oh boy, it, it changed me interiorly and, and 
I finally had a grasp of what the human person was about. Mm. That image created, um, you know, when you hear in the Old Testament, we get to uh, get to Holy Week and the and the Triduum, they breathed life into them. Mm. Do you ever have that image of here's little Brian Kane, you know, um, and he's he's breathing life into you. That's astounding. <laughs> and to share then forevermore in that divine life. Um, I always like to say to parents, so oh, Isaac, oh my gosh, um, you've been entrusted with something eternal in those yeah. eight months at home. Um, mm. it's, yeah. it's like a miracle. It's incredible when you actually see it. Mm -hmm. It's also tremendous responsibility at the same time. And Father, I had a question. I'd just like to ask you real quickly. I know um, probably getting close to the end of this segment, but yeah, keep it quick, Isaac. I'll do my best, Eric. <laughs> Thank you. I know you'll you'll definitely keep me online in line. Clearly, here. I didn't do that, so it's up to you. Yes. Um, <laughs> no, I will keep it quick. Um, so, I think that sometimes you you spoke earlier of wanting to be able to share the beauty of the Catholic faith with people. <clears throat> Truth, beauty, and goodness. Yes. And the reality that that is the Catholic faith is absolutely beautiful. We just don't always see it that way. We don't always see it right. Um, I think, for example, of the idea of going to heaven, and there's all these stereotypes. Am I going to sit on a fluffy white cloud and pluck a harp? Well, frankly, uh, that doesn't sound real great to me, you know. <laughs> And so I think a lot of times people it excites me. You know, <laughs> I just I mean I'm not, I'm not I, I'm not a harp guy. Right? Not shocking. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Um, maybe it's the diaper and little wings that I'm not loving. I don't know. But you know, there's TMI. <laughs> those those kind of stereotypes are very trite in comparison to the reality. And so I think it's important we try to share this overwhelming infinite beauty with people. So my little question for you here, and to ask this question, I have to admit to something that may seem slightly creepy. Now, before we did this, these guys know you a lot better than I do. Um, I Googled you. Yeah. So, all right, that's yes. all we have for tonight. <laughs> on Spirit <laughs> and Spy. Yeah. But no, I just, I just Googled your name and I came across <laughs> the Which Odyssey. Which did you see? None of them. <laughs> um, I, didn't, I didn't do that. Um, I came across the oddest little coincidence. Many years ago, and around the same year, I used to follow a blog called Whispers in the Logia. Oh, sure. Yeah. Phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's just a little bit of information, your, your, your bios for it being cathedral and so forth. And halfway down is where you had commented on a post on Whispers in the Logia of all the random things from 2011. Like, right at the same time, probably, I was following this. And your comment had something to do with liturgy. But then you pointed out, you, you transitioned and said... I think it was coming up on, it was Advent, you know, and let's remember Christ is coming. And then you quoted Dante. Do you remember making this comment? No, I don't. I sure wish I, <laughs> I, knew I, it. Sure wish I did. Yeah. That, that there is neither laughter nor hope in hell. Oh, yeah, right. mm -hmm. That here there is hope, but in heaven, or maybe it was in purgatory, there, there is hope, right? In heaven, there is no more need for hope. There is only laughter. Mm -hmm. And I have not read my Dante, unfortunately. And so I was just blown away by this line. This is not comedic laughter. I think that's what we think mm -hmm. of it as. But we've all had those moments, even a few in our life, when it's like in the midst of you think everything's going wrong and you suddenly discover like a miracle. It's like the empty tomb. That, oh. It's all gonna be all right. Yeah. That you want, there's that release if you just want to burst out in the most beautiful laughter. It's something that has nothing to do with comedy, nothing to do with humor it's, at it's all. It's about being a kid again. Could you just, what, and it's about hope and laughter. Could you just maybe say something to that? What, this is such a beautiful vision of heaven to me. Yeah. What, what brings I you I sure hope you get to see it. I do too. I know you're skeptical, but <laughs> you know what? God is infinite mercy, as you pointed out earlier. Um, <laughs> okay. I don't know. Can you just maybe share something about that? I, I was really struck I, by that quote. Yeah, listening a, a little bit to you, and I had forgotten that. I do remember that now, responding to and I'm sorry for enabling you. But. Um, I guess I would want to say that it's exhaling pure joy. There we go. Does that make sense? Yes. So, you, but you might think, well, that's not really, and that sounds a little bit trite, but you think of your buddy with the mushrooms? 
what theology of the body would say is that's that's in, in, that's the incarnation of goodness, and it, it's that mm. I'm, I'm sure there were quite a few. And it was. Laughs. I tried chicken of the woods. Yep, delicious. We use those in the Ch- The chicken fat mushroom, a rare delicacy. I think I'm now in the point oh oh one percent of people in the world that has tried the chicken fat mushroom. Chicken of the woods or head of the woods. Chicken is of the woods is more common. Yeah. Okay. Well, it, it because everything, every good in the world. Hey, we were talking mushrooms because, over here. Let's, yeah. <laughs> not that kind. Every good that God created becomes a sign, an icon, pointing us to the ultimate fulfillment in heaven. And so you can enjoy things rightly. And this is what Christ means by those who give up land and family for my sake and for the sake of the kingdom will receive a hundredfold in this life and eternal, eternal life, life in, in heaven, come. right? Yeah. And that's where I, I feel like Family Renewal Project comes in and FRP, you know, and all the work that, you know, we do uh, is a gift because, I mean, they played a role in even how this came together. And that's a miracle and another episode by itself. And so perhaps <laughs> we'll have you again, Father, yes, just to talk about Family Renewal Project, your role and vision for that. But thank you so much for this time today. Uh, Thank you, and thanks for mentioning Family Renewal Project. The fruits of that apostolate uh, have been tremendous. It's been large. It's been a beautiful harvest. Uh, So it goes back to um, every area of the apostolate that um, that, uh, was fortunate and blessed to be a part of from the very beginning. And oh my gosh, I I think of... (laughs) It's kind of the Mother Angelica story, you know? I think I'll go to Alabama and somebody's going to give me 30 acres. But <laughs> 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 it happened, you know? Yeah. Maybe that's how I get my farm. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Just pray, start praying. That's right. Start praying to St. Isidore. And listen to that song, Buy Dirt. I will. Yeah, I will. <laughs> uh, so that it's lifting up what of what is true and beautiful and good and uh, when I when I observe people and watch folks that are a part of it, um, that, that 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 becomes visible, and that 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 in itself is, um, oh, wow, truly the work of God, and it it does have some, I think it does have some miracle status with it. So mm. If you think of where where we are today and uh, what's happened and how it started. It's beautiful. It's a real blessing from God. Well, we'll bring him back for that. Okay. All right. So we talked about the Cathedral of the Assumption here. We've talked about FRP. Father, I just want to give you this opportunity. If there's anything else you want to plug, um, speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, anything else <laughs> uh, going on? Yes. I, I feel like that what I really want to plug uh, is uh, the, working with uh, the Arch- Archbishop Kurtz, Archbishop Fob, and the, uh, the role of Vicar General is great. Um, being at the rector is very fine. Every parish church and every church experiences its own challenges. Uh, but I want to go back to the very beginning. Uh, so T.S. Eliot that said, in the beginning is my end, and in the end is my beginning. Mm-hmm. Uh, that I, I want to go back to vocations. And I, I brought a quote with me. If you don't mind, we can end this way and sort of let it be our prayer for vocations. Uh, both to the priesthood and, and, and to the religious life. You may or may not know that when I was at uh, St. James in Elizabethtown, uh, we were blessed that the Dominican Sisters of St. Cecilia came, uh, both to, to, uh, to have their mission, they would refer, they're going out on mission, which I think is a great term, uh, both in the parish and in the school. It was a great, great blessing. Um, so I think of all the, um, and I do know uh, some young women who, the Lord's touching their hearts to do that. So I just want to read this quote and uh, ask everyone, I uh, said at the very beginning, whew, vocations, the seeds for that are planted at home. Uh, so pay attention to that. Uh, and that requires holy marriages as well? Right? It does, it does, yeah. it does. And I've heard it described as a crisis. I mean, we need vocations. Is that, is. Is that an appropriate term? Priests, religious, I've, faithful I've, spouses. Yeah, I have I have yeah. used that, I mean, if you could See, so the numbers, you, you, you want to be scared, but what, guess what? Jesus, I trust in you. Mm. Mm. Amen. Amen. He is not going to um, let the church suffer and be, a, what's, what is when you're vitamin, you're, don't, um, 
anemic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he will not let uh, his bride be anemic, so we can trust that. Yeah. And, and, and I asked the question, can't they... you know, what are we supposed to be learning? You know, what are we supposed to be learning? Uh, I mentioned, and then this will be the close, I promise. I had a discerner's retreat a uh, weekend before last, and uh, it's by invitation, you know, would you like to? And they all said yes. Didn't have Praise anybody God. say no. Praise God. Wow. There were two who had to go to college earlier than expected, so they couldn't come. So we had 10. I thought, well, well we're okay. Um, from that already, uh, now this is not, again, that they had just suddenly this appeared on their screen, uh, but they've been praying, discerning. Uh, so blessed be God. Uh, one, so I had time one-on-one -on -one with them. Uh, we held it at St. Minor. Uh, one, <laughs> he came down and sat down, so well, I'm ready to begin the application. Wow, that's awesome. awesome. <laughs> uh, one of the young men that couldn't uh, go because of college uh, sent a text over the weekend. I guess, sorry, I couldn't be there, um, but I'm ready to begin the application. Praise so, God. Wow. Amen. Fruits are already. This is one of my favorite quotes. Um, I showed it to you all when we were just on a little break. Uh, the priest, young priest, uh, I'm going to assume newly ordained, that is uh, weeping at the time of the consecration. If you hold it up under your chin, our viewers will be able to see it on that camera over there. Right. <laughs> I am not the young priest. <laughs> the once, but he might play you, you in your future movie. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, but I share this with uh, lots of uh, the younger priests that have uh, that we've been in parishes together. Uh, so we'll end this way and kind of let this to be our prayer, that those will say yes to this life. It's by a Dominican priest, uh, Father John Baptiste Henry Lacordaire. To live in the midst of the world with no desire for its pleasures, to be a member of every family yet belonging to none, to share all sufferings, to penetrate all secrets, to heal all wounds, to daily go from men to God to offer him their homage and petitions, to return from God to men, to bring them his pardon and hope, to have a heart of fire for charity and a heart of bronze for chastity, to bless and to be blessed forever. O oh God, what a life, and it is yours, O oh priest of Jesus Christ. So may the Lord bless you and keep you, my brothers here, and all of those who have joined us, the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Go in peace. <laughs> Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you, Father. <laughs> Thank you. All right. It's been another rousing episode <laughs> of Spirit Inspire. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week right here.